Welcome to Parenting Successful Teens, the podcast that cuts through the overwhelm and stress of this phase and offers parents simple, practical, cognitive, science-based strategies for keeping their teens on track. Join master coach and real-life mom, Allie Irwin, to talk about real teens, real problems, and the skills it takes to raise successful adults. One of the most common things I hear when I tell people that I'm a parent coach is the person will laugh and say, well, I don't need coaching. My kids do. I'm fine, but it's my son that's making poor choices. How will coaching me help him? This is such a great question because underlying it is the thought that what the parent does doesn't matter, that somehow the parent's behavior and the son's behavior aren't affecting each other. Because if you're saying that changing how you think and act with your child won't change their behavior, you're a, to a certain degree, you're saying that your parenting doesn't matter. But we don't really believe that because always or often in the same conversation, the parent will say some version of, I don't know why he's acting that way. He was raised better. So they're caught between believing that their actions do matter to their child, that their their child should be behaving differently because they were raised better, and believing that their parenting doesn't matter because they don't believe that changing themselves would change their kid's behavior. And it's so interesting because in a way they're right. Your actions do matter a lot, and in other ways they don't matter at all. (laughs) (laughs) And I think that that's why more parents don't get coaching is because they're caught in that middle ground. What I want to do in today's podcast is frame that in a different way. I want to look at that truth that our actions both matter a lot and not at all in a more helpful way. And what it boils down to is that as your kids transition from those early childhood years into adulthood, you want to start having more interactions with your kids and fewer transactions. So in today's podcast, we're going to talk about what both of those things are, and I want to help you understand the difference and to know when you're in which kind of mode, whether you're in interaction mode or transaction mode. I think this is going to make a big difference. I think that making this shift will give you more influence with your kids. You'll fall more into the camp that your behavior as a parent, that you matter. Because we know you matter, right? Like you haven't forgotten that. You know you matter. Okay. A transaction usually fits into an if-then statement. If you want to borrow the car, then you have to pick up bread and milk. It's one direction. If this, then that. If I let you stay out until 11, then you have to have all your homework done first. If this, then that. So the reverse direction may or may not be true. Just because you're willing to pick up bread and milk doesn't mean that you can borrow the car. It doesn't mean that I'm going to say yes to the concert just because your homework's done. Transactions are like one-way streets. You're dictating the terms of the agreement. And for simple things like borrowing the car, they can work. But where transactions go awry is when we're expecting hidden things in the transaction. Like we assume the other person knows that if they're going to borrow the car this afternoon, that we want the bread and milk by a certain time, or we want the car returned full of gas, or, you know, that we don't want their annoying friend Becky in the car when they do whatever it is they're going to do this afternoon. Okay, there's hidden terms. Or if you want them to have a certain feeling about the transaction, like gratitude, if you're trying to dictate their emotional state in the exchange, that's most likely a transaction. (laughs) And the last one, I made some notes. The last one is where it goes awry is if they can't borrow the car, if you think what they're doing is a stupid waste of time. (laughs) 
<laughs> That's from an, from an actual client. The fact that you think what they're doing is a stupid waste of time and they still want to do that thing and you're able to dictate whether or not you're going to allow them to have the car, that's a transaction. Interactions, on the other hand, they happen between two or more people that are having an effect on each other. Okay, interactions are like two-way streets. And the two-wayness of the interaction is essential to the difference between transactions and interactions. Okay, and the same borrowing the car example. If there's an underlying respect for each other, it becomes more of a conversation than just you dictating the terms. Okay, and I want to note here, like... Sometimes it's the kids in families today. Sometimes it's the kids that are dictating all the terms. What's going on there is because the relationships are so tense that the parents will do anything to avoid a fight. They will say yes to all kinds of things they don't want to say yes to because they don't want to fight with their kids. And (laughs) then that goes back into a transaction. Like if I lend you the car, then we don't have to argue about it. Okay, so transactions... The difference between the two is the one-wayedness, whether it's you dictating all the terms or you feel like your kids are dictating all the terms. The one-wayness of the terms, that's what makes the difference. And this distinction is important for this stage because when our kids were little, we did have a lot more transactions. More of their life functioned like a one-way street. (laughs) We didn't typically let our toddlers dictate what we're going to have for dinner, right? We didn't, or else it would just be frosting and cookies. (laughs) We didn't dictate when they went to bed. Like most households, there's a bedtime and a bedtime routine. Actually, that's an important distinction. Bedtime is a transaction. Bedtime routine is usually an interaction that's usually kind of worked out between the parent and the child, how many stories and bath time and all of that. That's usually an interaction. And what's different between these two stages, like I'm going to use a food example. When kids were little, many families say something like, you can have dessert if you finish all your dinner, or maybe you can have dessert if you just finish all your carrots. You had the option to control whether or not they got dessert, because for the most part, if you didn't buy it, they didn't need it. Unless they were at grandma's house, then all bets were off. But as our kids get older, they become responsible for more of their own lives. They can buy their own treats. They don't need you to say they can have a cookie because they've got babysitting money. And they can swing by Starbucks on the way home from practice with their friends. Okay, they can get their own treats, whether they do their chores or not, because you have less control over them. And that loss of control is usually a major bummer for parents. (laughs) They want to go back to the old days because they still want their kids to have healthy eating habits. And it just feels safer and easier and faster to be able to control things. But here is the dirty little secret of teenage years is that control is a lie. (laughs) And We really don't have control over our kids as they get older. And the people that are most successful as adults are the people who learn to control their own lives, okay? So long-term, we want our kids to outgrow our control. We want them to grow into adults that can manage their own lives. But in order to do that, we have to start letting them practice right now, which feels inconvenient (laughs) and kind of annoying, right? Because they're not going to do things the way you want them to. And you're still trying to parent while you're in this space of giving over some control and responsibility to them. Okay, And the logic of that is pretty sound. If I try and control everything, they can't learn to make good choices because they are literally not making choices. I'm still making the choices. So knowing that it's annoying, knowing that it's necessary, how do we start making that shift? And that's where I think this idea comes in 
where we start thinking about our relationship as interactions rather than transactions. Okay, in interactions, we step back in taking responsibility, not just for their physical lives, but for their thinking as well. Especially as our teens get into high school, we want to really start seeing them as separate people from us who have their own valid opinions, their own opinions that they're worth listening to, even if they contradict ours. So for your teen, that might be them declaring one year that they hate beach vacations after having gone on a beach vacation with you <laughs> every year since they were, you know, in pull-ups. Or they might say that they like to study with the music on, even though you're convinced that they can't think clearly with all that racket. Or, and this one's harder for a lot of parents, I've definitely, definitely had clients struggle with the idea that their kids are questioning the religious beliefs that they hold so dear. Okay, this is, these are hard. I mean, these examples seem laughable, but for that parent whose child suddenly doesn't want to go on vacation with them or re rejects their religion or they're worried about them getting their homework done, those feel like big things. And yet those parents have to start thinking about their relationship as a two-way street. They have to start giving their kids the opportunity to make more decisions, to make more decisions, not just about what they do, but how they think. And they have to do that. The parents that successfully do that build a foundation for their adult relationship with their kids. Okay, that's the payoff, is that you raise kids that can be successful and kids that still want to have a relationship with you. And the other payoff is your kids actually have a lot to teach you. Their stage of growth, like the teen years are amazing. Their whole world is opening up at this age and they're seeing things. They may seem jaded and okay, boomer <laughs> about everything that's going on. But the truth be told, their world is opening up. And as adults, we can really benefit from that. It, Example is the attention that our kids give to their friends. You know, they're obsessed with being there with their friends all the time and on the phone and texting and Instagram. And I guess they're not talking on the phone, but they're texting on the phone. And instead of being upset about how much time our kids spend with their friends, we can take a cue from them and start developing stronger friendships for ourselves. And, you know, I also coach people through that empty nest phase. And the people that most successfully navigate the empty nest are the people that started preparing for it while their kids were pulling away through high school. Okay, they embraced and learned from their kids' desire for independence, and the parents started getting independence as well. So when their kids get interested in nihilism or volleyball or graphic novels or vegan cuisine or, you know, any of a myriad of things, politics, we can find a way to let their new interests expand our interests as well. Even if we don't share an interest <laughs> in those things, just being exposed to the idea of like learning about new things and experiencing those things with our kids, that fuels our own expansion. And rather than trying to clamp down and hold on and go back to the way things were, what I'd like to suggest is to loosen your grip and trust that as their world expands and they gain more independence, that they will be okay and that there will still be a place for you in that world. Because as adults, we get to decide who we spend our time with, <laughs> okay? You can't actually dictate that your kids enjoy spending time with you forever. <laughs> and most of us don't choose to spend time with people that disregard our thoughts and opinions and just dictate everything, okay? Most adults call those people toxic <laughs> and they avoid them. 
And when it's our parents that are doing that to us, we call them meddlesome and overbearing and control freaks, and we avoid them. And we even get into transaction mode with nice things. I've seen parents make big, grand gestures that weren't what the kids wanted, and then they were mad that their kids weren't more grateful for all that they'd done for them. Or they'd made big, grand gestures that were what the kids wanted, but then they had this secret transaction in their mind that that gratitude would extend in a couple of other ways. And when it's done from that place of transaction, it turns generosity into manipulation. And I'm not saying that you don't teach your kids to be grateful. Gratitude is a huge skill for appreciating your life. But expecting gratitude from your kids is different than them being genuinely grateful. Okay, genuine gratitude comes from interactions, not from transactions. Transactions by their kid a new iPhone, hoping that their kid will be so grateful that they'll respond to text better. And then they get mad when their kids <laughs> respond the way they did with their old phone. Interactions have conversations about the expectations that meet everyone's need, both for independence and connection. And then consequences if those expectations aren't met. Interactions assume that you both have valid ideas and valid views that are important and that you can work together to find a way to meet everyone's needs. Transactions say, or else. <laughs> and if you're seeing a lot of passive aggressive behavior, that is a transaction red flag. Okay. Anytime anyone is meeting the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law, that's a transaction red flag. Another example to consider is the idea that Sometimes when your child is struggling, they want to figure it out for themselves, okay? It, interactions are based on the idea of developing their independence and being more of a support and a resource rather than trying to jump in and fix it, okay? <laughs> Even when they're struggling, sometimes they don't want your help. Like, they want to figure it out on their own. And... Maybe what they need at this moment is the option to fail at this in order to see what works for them. And interactions allow that sometimes you, the parent, are wrong about what's needed. It opens up the idea that you, it should be relaxing because it means you don't have to know everything. Interactions allow you to learn from them new ways of doing things or maybe things that you thought needed to be done that don't need to be done. And the benefit of that is really that two-wayness, the idea that you are benefiting from them as much as they are benefiting from you. And kids know when you respect them. Like when you believe that they've got this, they can tell whether you're placating them or whether you really respect them. And interactions promote that. Doing this transition well is no joke important. It's why coaching parents is so exciting to me because I really think that this is part of the foundation of healthy adult relationships with your children. It's like the difference between stilted, perfunctory, required holiday visits and actually being excited to get together and like getting random Tuesday afternoon texts because your kids saw something funny on Instagram. Okay, that, that difference is your relationship. There isn't some magic day where you wake up and you're like, okay, my kids are adults now and they're in charge of their life and I'm ready to hand over all the reins. It's a process. And through these teen years, you are still in charge of your kids, of both the interactions and the transactions. But you as the leader, as the parent, you're starting to shift that balance. Like your kids will start shifting it and you starting to shift it at the same time, then you're both supporting that and your kids can feel that you're starting to let go. And then they don't have to pull away as much. 
Okay, you, they'll actually be more likely to ask you for support when they need it because they can feel, like I said, you can't fake this. Like they can feel when you respect them. <laughs> And you may need support through this process because it really, it's not easy to tell because sometimes your help with your kids is absolutely wanted and needed. When you get involved then, that's an interaction. That's a two-way street. They want and need your help and you want and need to provide it. And sometimes <laughs> your help is neither needed nor wanted they're maybe going to absolutely do things in a way that works, but makes you crazy. And you may need support in <laughs> staying out of it because it's so obvious to you that there's a better way, except for there isn't a better way because for them, their way is the better way. Okay. And if they want and need your help, then you'll go back to that first scenario, you know, and you'll, it'll be obvious when it's time to step in, but you may need support letting go of that era because for sure they may do things <laughs> pretty differently than you would. But really the most difficult to manage is when you sense they need your help, but they don't want it. To manage that well, like it's so important that you've developed that strong two-way relationship because when those situations come up, when it feels really clear that they need your help, but they don't want your help, Having practiced on all the smaller, lower stakes is your best bet of navigating those situations well. I hope this was helpful. You are so worth investing in as a parent. These podcasts are my way of investing in you. I believe in you. And I believe that when you are better equipped to lead your kids through their transitions, then you're giving yourself the best possible chance at raising a successful teen and having a healthy adult relationship with your kids. Okay, and if you could use some help in developing that stronger two-way relationship, if you're having trouble letting go or if you're having trouble deciding when to step in and when to step out and how to lead through this time, you can shoot me an email with Let's Talk in the subject line, you can send that to Allie at AllieIrwin.com. And I will send you a link to my calendar to set up time for a call. And on that call, we will talk specifically about what's going on in your family. I know with these podcasts, it can be kind of hard to tell sometimes how to, how to apply it directly to your family. And that's what these free consultation calls are all about. And you'll leave that call with a clear understanding of what's really happening and a concrete idea that you can put into practice right away. So you can either, like I said, you can shoot me an email at Allie at AllieIrwin.com or there'll be a link in the show notes that you can click on that will take you directly to my calendar. Have a great week, everybody. Thanks for listening to Parenting Successful Teens. If you enjoyed today's show, then I've got a treat for you. I have a free guide that teaches you how to get your teenagers to tell you about their day. No more one-word answers. <laughs> and grabbing this guide is super easy. Just text the phrase, get teens talking as all one word, no spaces, to the number 44222. So that's the phrase, get teens talking without any spaces to the number double four triple two. And then you'll be prompted to give the email address that you want the guide sent to. And then it shows up in your email box, just like magic. <laughs> you know what else is magic? Having teenagers that talk to you. Now, I can't promise that you're going to like everything they have to say, but I can promise better conversations. Grab the guide and I'll talk to you next week.